Review prostate MR cases online. Answer each case according to our structured pro forma answer page. And then get immediate feedback against the radical prostatectomy. 300 cases, track your progress, earn CME points, visit mripro.io. To yet another uh, webinar that's being uh, put together by MRI Pro. My name is Jeremy Grummet. I'm an associate professor uh, in urology at Monash University and Alfred Health in Melbourne, uh, Australia. Uh, and we have a stellar guest panelist uh, on the webinar today, uh, which I'll be, who I'll be introducing very shortly. But before I do that, um, I just wanted to uh, show a very short explainer video uh, of MRI Pro and what it uh, involves. So just bear with me for just a moment while we show you that video. Review prostate MR cases online. Answer each case according to our structured pro forma answer page, and then get immediate feedback against the radical prostatectomy. 300 cases, track your progress, earn CME points, visit mripro.io. All right, there we go. So hopefully that just gives you a little very quick window on how uh, the online program uh, to teach you how to uh, read prostate MRI uh, goes. Um, I'd also like to thank Movember, um, obviously being Movember, the month of Movember, uh, the Movember Foundation has been a great supporter of MRI Pro um, over the years. So thank you to them. Um, with regard to how MRI Pro works, um, it's you can purchase a, a subscription that's either monthly or annual. Um, and at the moment, uh, MRI Pro is offering a first month subscription for free. Uh, so if you go to the chat, uh, in this webinar, you'll see a coupon code that can be used so that you can ac access uh, the entire program uh, and the first month uh, is for free. So uh, please take advantage of that. It is a limited offer uh, and ends uh, on December the 5th. Speaking of the chat function, we do want this to be as interactive as possible. Uh, we are expecting a lot of people uh, to uh, attending, um, but that doesn't mean we can't at least try and uh, get as many of you involved as the in the conversation as possible. Now, uh, to our very special guests, uh, and obviously this particular webinar has got an American uh, flavour, both North and South uh, American. Um, delighted uh, to be and honoured to be joined by uh, Dr. Claire Tempany, um, who is the Frank Yoles Professor of Radiology at Harvard Medical School. She's also the Vice Chair of Radiology Research and Medical Director of the Advanced Multimodal Image Guided Operating, that's Amigo Suite, uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Claire, welcome. Thank you, Jeremy. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, looking forward to this and meeting you all. All right, thanks, Claire. Um, we also have Dr. Valder Muglia, uh, who is Associate Professor of Radiology and Urology at Ribeiro Preto Medical School, University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, Valder is also the President of the Brazilian College of Radiology. Valder, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy. It's a pleasure to be here and share this moment with so uh, skilled people and looking forward to this, to this webinar. Terrific. And last but certainly not least, we have uh, Dr. Samir Tanasia. Samir, thanks for joining us. Uh, Samir will be well known, I'm sure, to all of you. Um, and he is the James M. and Janet Riha Nisa Professor of Urologic Oncology um, and Professor of Urology and Radiology and Director of the Division of Urologic Oncology at NYU Langone Medical Center uh, in New York City. Samir, great to see you again. Oh, it's great to see all of you and thanks for including me in the panel, it should be fun. All right, and of course we have our usual suspects, our local experts, Richard O'Sullivan, radiologist at uh, Bridge Road uh, Imaging, uh, which is now under the, under the banner of Loomis. Hi, Richard. Hi, thanks for having me. This should be fun. this should be a very interesting meeting. Welcome all. And, and of course, we have Andrew Ryan, who's our expert uropathologist uh, at Tissue Path uh, here in Australia as well. Andrew, thanks for joining us once again. All right, now just very quick outline of uh, how we run this. Um, we uh, have done several of these webinars now, uh, and the format is always the same. It's very relaxed, conversational, case based. Uh, looking at, uh, hopefully today we'll get through four cases, um, three or four. Um, we will need to keep to time. 
Um, and as I said, please feel free to use the chat or Q&A function uh, so that you can get involved. So Richard, are you happy to get cracking? Um, and I'll perhaps introduce the uh, clinical background of case number one. If you can get your screen up while I'm doing that. So our first case is a 64 year old man with a slightly elevated PSA of 5.3. Uh, digital rectal examination uh, revealed just a benign feeling prostate, but based on the elevated PSA. And we uh, always repeat the PSA, usually one to three months after the original one to check if it's still elevated. That was still elevated and went on to have a subsequent MRI. So Richard, are you happy to take us through that? Sure. So um, we use a semen 3T scar with uh, a body coil, um, uh, no endorectal coil. Uh, this is how we set up, uh, so it's a lot of images, I'll break them down into some uh, more individual images in a moment, but we use the three plane T2, sagittal uh, in the top left hand corner, uh, axial T2 in the bottom left hand corner, and then the uh, coronal T2s, and we do um, we, we do uh, diffusion in two separate uh, planes, we do the axial diffusion, the, this image here is the ADC, the top right hand corner is the high B value diffusion imaging, and then we do the same thing in the sagittal plane, and uh, unless there's a contraindication to contrast, we give the pa all, we, all the patients get contrast. Um, so just to make that uh, slightly easier. So if I link these four images, we'll just go from top to bottom. So if we, if we go from uh, base to apex, uh, seminal vesicles here, we'll just go through a bit of normal anatomy as we go. Uh, axial, uh, the uh, transition zone here, quite a large transition zone. This is a prostate volume of 50 cc. And as we go more peripherally, we can see the peripheral zone coming into, fo into focus here. Uh, as we go more inferiorly, we can see the uh, index lesion in this patient uh, on the high B value diffusion imaging. It's, uh, homogeneous decreasing intensity. I've got it measured over 1.9 centimetres. It demonstrates uh, restricted diffusion. Uh, it's uh, got a low ADC. I've got it measured at about 600. Uh, increase of intensity on the high B value diffusion in the top and the bottom right hand corner. And there's focal contrast enhancement. We can see in the top right hand corner, that's the uh, images, that's the subtracted images rather than the color images. The color images show the same thing. Uh, we can see here. You'll also notice that uh, there is a second lesion. Uh, so I'll go back to. If we, as we go back, there's a, there's a focal area in the postlateral proof zone at the left apex. I've got that measured at 0.5 centimeters. It's relatively difficult to visualize on T2 images, but again, demonstrates restrictive diffusion with uh, decreasing intensity ADC, high on the high B value and focal contrast enhancement. We can see both of those lesions on the high B value, the, uh, the sagittal images. This is the, uh, the sagittal image of the high B value in the top right hand corner here, uh, high, uh, with increasing intensity. And the second lesion, which is a Pirates 4 lesion we see here on the sagittals as well. Uh, the, if we look at the, the, whether this patient's got extra capsule extension, it does clearly uh, abut the capsule over greater than two centimetres. And if we look on the, uh, the T2 is the most useful, we can see there is a clear capsule of bulge on this transition zone lesion at the apex. It's separate, it's different to the capsule elsewhere, but there's no definite extra capsule extension. So I report those out as, as a, uh, a high risk of uh, extra capsule extension, but no mass. That's terrific. Thank you, Richard. Um, Claire, if I can ask you first, I know it's difficult when you're not in control of the, of the images yourself, but just looking at the way Richard has presented uh, each of those series, what do you typically do similarly and what do you do differently in your practice in terms of how you actually do the acquire and read the MRI and display it? So I think the acquisition parameters look very, or what I could see uh, was very similar. So it's three planes of T2, axial sagittal coronal, 
axial diffusion and axial uh, dynamic contrast enhanced after the injection of gadolinium. I think what I saw might be that flashed by quickly was a sagittal diffusion, uh, which we don't do. Um, and it'd be interesting to hear what, what, what the rationale, Richard, is for that. But um, we do everything else, I think, very, very similar. Uh, and as, uh, as a PyRADS person, I'm very happy to see you're complying with PyRADS. Uh, we certainly like everyone to comply and, and to follow that. Uh, so that's brilliant. And um, your way of reading and presenting it was, uh, you know, exactly to the point. I mean, obviously, you don't start off by presenting the mass. Uh, you obviously go through the, the images. And as I try to teach my residents and fellows, you start at image one and you end at image 3000, if that's what you have. And you have to go through them all. Um, but of course, to be honest, when I'm there without a resident or a fellow and it's just me, I jump in really quickly. And the first thing I look at it are the T2s, the axial T2. That tells me so much and, and it probably dates me a little bit because I've been at this for a while. Uh, but T2 gives you the lay of the land, so to speak. It shows you the anatomy. It shows you the substructure. It shows you what size of a gland you're, you're looking at. And it also, if it's good quality, which nowadays, thank God, most of them are, uh, gives you a lot of good information. I don't start with the diffusion. I, I used to, but, but the problem with diffusion, you'll, you'll miss things and you'll get a bit distracted. So I always go with T2 first. And it was really interesting when Richard was showing it. Um, and I don't know if it's possible to go back, Richard, but you showed a coronal image of the T2s. And immediately on that coronal image, you could see the mass of the apex. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that was just, it's so interesting when you see it in a different plane and it just jumps right out at you. Uh, that's an unusual location uh, for a tumor. It's incredibly low down um, and it's apical. But that's, you know, I think you're absolutely reading it in the same way. You see it right there, exactly. Where, where Richard's arrow is right now is showing us that the extension, the prostate doesn't normally come down like that. You'll see the, pia, the, the peripheral zone should wrap around. But in this case, because we've got such a big mass there, the mass is preventing, obviously it's obliterated the normal peripheral zone at that level. So that would be, I would it be, uh, your protocol looks exactly the same. We did, we're not getting into looking at lymph nodes and bone and things like that here, but um, I'm assuming you, you have nodal images in there. I would chat a little bit about whether there's extracapsular extension here. Um, I truly think this lesion is invading the external urethral sphincter uh, or the EUS. And um, Samir, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, that's a T3 lesion. Um, and it's a really important location because that really would preclude doing um, continent sparing surgery. Uh, because if you want to remove this entire tumor, uh, you're gonna to have to cut the sphincter. So that's a thought about the location. Thank you very much, Claire. That's fantastic. Did you want to follow up on that, Samir? Yeah, uh, so I agree. It's a pretty ugly looking lesion at the apex. Uh, it's deforming the uh, apical urethra and perhaps the beginning of the membranous urethra as well. So whenever I see that collapse of the lumen, uh, the significance of that to me is twofold. One, uh, I don't think those are good lesions for focal therapy. I wouldn't have considered it in this case anyway, given the size, but you see the deformity, uh, sort of the mass shift effect on the, on the urethra. And uh, I don't know, it's a urologist perception, but whenever I see it, the urethra, that little notch in the bottom of the urethra, I know I'm about at the level of the vera montanum. Uh, and so it, it's tough to say, Claire, whether we would be able to preserve enough urethra to give him a fair shot at continence. I do see some lateral extension as well at the level of the urethra, but I always think it's a little tricky in the anterior apex as opposed to the posterior. Posterior apex, you can sort of definitively say where it is along the sphincter. Depending on the acquisition angle, you could be looking at the very distal posterior apex, but be slightly more proximal on the anterior apex. So, you know, I would, I would do what you do and evaluate this in 3D to try and get a good sense of that. But I agree with you, the apical margin is potentially a problem here. Okay. Thanks, Samir. Valdir, just going back to uh, a comparison, I guess, of what you uh, would do in Sao Paulo, um, is there anything different um, in terms of how you would uh, acquire or read the MRI, or is it pretty much the same as your practice? Yeah, it's pretty much the same. We follow, actually follow closely the, the PyRAS recommendation, including the protocol and the way we interpret the, 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 
the whole examination, the whole images. And I, I agree with Claire that is, for me, T2 is the workhorse on prostate MRI. So I, I love to see axial images and I like to see uh, usually a sagittal and axial on, on same screen, split the screen and, and that because I, I like the relationship, anatomical relationship that sagittal provides to us. So usually look both both of the two sagittal and axial for the first images. And also going back to you, Claire, you picked up, just to pick up on your comment about sagittal images um, and, and looking at uh, these images in different planes. It's a topic that's come up uh, a few times actually throughout these webinars, because I know Richard um, is, a, is a real uh, fan of the sagittal views and, and the, the different perspectives they provide. Richard, did you want to make any comment on that as to as to Claire was asking before you know why is it that you do that routinely um, I must admit I think the diffusion is the most important sequence we have uh, for the detection of cancer um, the problem is that with MR in general is that there's a slice and then there's a gap uh, and so when we're looking at a curved surface like a prostate gland it's possible to actually miss the lesion because it could be in the gap some of the lesions we see are very small you know three four millimeters and the bits that I find personally difficult are at the base and the apex. Uh, and so I find that uh, the diffusion is very useful in both of those two areas. It's also useful at the base, whether you can see the uh, lesion going into the seminal vesicles as well. It just gives us, it's all about building confidence, uh, I think, about which is the most important, uh, we're not missing a lesion. So it just gives me more confidence having another look at the, at the gland. Just to go back on that, Claire, do you sometimes use sagittal or it's it's never part of the, the um, acquisition? No. Yeah, we, with the sagittal T2s are what we do. And, you know, I agree with Richard. It, whatever gives you the confidence, as long as, I mean, you know, you have to have the three ingredients. You have to have T2 diffusion and, and contrast. But, you know, which planes, um, we could debate this probably forever till the cows come home or something. But, you know, it's um, it's if you've got the time and you can do it and you like it, gosh, there's no reason not to. Um, mm. Anything that can give you some, some extra confidence. And yes, I agree entirely. The diffusion is by far the most important sequence, but it's just, I really love to start with the T2. So I don't. I hope I wasn't mis, mis, misrepresenting um, the importance of DWI. It mm. is what transformed prostate MRI. I mean, that's the sequence that helps us find the Gleason grade pattern four. Yeah. Yeah. And just to pick up on uh, DCE dynamic uh, contrast enhancement, obviously that's... Uh, it was downgraded in the, you know, in the follow-up uh, version of the Pyrads uh, system. What are your thoughts, Claire, on, on DCE currently? Obviously, it's still part of the uh, way we read uh, MRI. Do you think it's going to stick around? Well, I, you know, I think for the moment it is. Um, there are lots of people biting at the, the, the bit to get rid of it, and most of them are administrators. Because <laughs> if, if we get rid of it, it'll shorten the exam and, and decrease the cost. Right. Um, but that's not what we're in the business of. We're, we're doing a, this to help our patients. So I'm arguing strongly to keep it there. And I also think it's incredibly important um, for the learning curve, people uh, who are beginning. Um, it's pretty easy after a while not to really use the gadolinium. And we've, you know, there's a lot of papers being published now about the Pyrads 3. How often does the gadolinium really help? And that's the group. It's Pyrads 3s in the peripheral zone. They're the only ones you're really supposed to use the DCE for. Um, you know, maybe it's somewhere between 10, 15% of the time it makes a difference. That's a, that's a significantly high number to say, you know, why not? But the obvious, you know, the issue is the cost, but more importantly is patient safety. And gadolinium, obviously we know in certain patient populations should not be used. Um, so we can do well without it. But the two things are the, it, the inexperienced reader and the other one is the quality of our diffusion images. The quality of any sequence, the one that's the all guaranteed to be the worst, is always the diffusion, which is the one you really want to be the best. Right. Um, and so I think until the vendors, and we've been beating on the vendors and everybody, and, and a lot of us are doing research now into trying to improve diffusion, but we're not there yet. So I know everyone wants to go to biparametric, but I don't believe it. And I've, certainly in my practice, because we do a lot of patients who are coming back for recurrent disease, they're on chemotherapy trials or new adjuvant trials. Those patients, the recurrence and the, the um, uh, looking for residual tumor, gadolinium is extremely helpful. Yeah. So we keep it for now. Yeah. 
Thank you, Claire. Just uh, looking at a comment we've come uh, come in from the chat from Vivica Lagaga, uh, who I know is uh, coming in from Denmark. Um, she says that sagittal diffusion weighted are great. We do reconstruction from axial high B value. Now, in the interest of time, we better keep moving because we're still on the first case. Andrew, are you happy to uh, show us the biopsy result? We, this patient uh, ended up having a, a typical transperineal biopsy with targeted and uh, template cause. So you should be seeing that now. So uh, disease in the right mid and right posterior, low grade, low volume, up to 1.5 millimetres. But our target biopsy left apex uh, showed high volume disease up to 13 millimetres, 3 plus 4, 20%. And interestingly, you know, when we've been hearing what you've been saying about the the radiolo radiological appearance or MRI appearance, uh, we've got a comment in the bottom of this where the tumour in that left apex is in association with skeletal muscle, and that's all very uh, in keeping with what you're describing on the MRI. Mm. So how did you stage it? Oh, sorry, this is only a biopsy. Sorry. That's yeah. just the biopsy, yeah. Sorry, but, sorry. but we do put this, you know, we went through a stage where we were putting this in, um, you know, whether it was useful, we didn't get a lot of feedback, but um, whether mm. it was useful, it certainly uh, is in there. When you say association with skeletal, skeletal muscle, though, Andrew, it's adjacent to rather than within. No, it's in association with. It's very hard on biopsy to kind of, you know, skeletal muscle trickles in that the junction on on histology on such, you know, on a core is very difficult. So we would never definitively call it 3A and say that it was involving the the urethra, uh, the um, pelvic floor at, at that point. But it is just a bit of a flag. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, Samir, I have to ask you at this point, um, how are you doing your biopsies now? I know when I visited you a few years ago, you were uh, using uh, some software for fusion, um, going transrectally. Is your practice the same or have you changed? Jeremy, I'm almost afraid to answer you, knowing your passions, but um, we, we've changed a bit. We certainly have the ability to do transperineal fusion biopsies now, both using the Artemis device and a number of others. And in particular, in patients in whom we're planning focal therapy, we find transperineal mapping uh, to be uh, a, perhaps a, you know, a better way to assess the disease distribution. Um, there are select patients in whom we choose to do it because of the location. Anterior locations are obviously better sampled by transperineal but we're still not to the point where we routinely do transperineal in everybody, although I realize that's the political and scientific push in the field. And I think there's tremendous groundswell behind it. And perhaps that's where we'll be in the future. Uh, you know, one informs their process by their own outcomes. And, you know, I've told you before, we have incredibly low infection rates at NYU using some of the management strategies we've used with transrectal biopsies. So we are still doing uh, transrectal fusion and probably the majority of the patients we manage. Okay, thank you. And I noticed you've you've dropped in conversation very casually a couple of times already now. Focal therapy, uh, as if it's uh, de rigueur. Is it what what is the status of focal therapy at NYU at the moment, Samir? Well, we you know we have a quite a large experience with it. Not quite as large as some of our colleagues in London. You know, I was speaking with some of the people in London the other day, and I know their patient numbers are in the thousands now. But we've probably now treated at NYU between seven and eight hundred men over the last decade uh, with focal ablative approaches using either. You know, I've used a variety of energy sources over the years, but now when we treat people outside of clinical trial, it's either with focal cryosurgery ablation. Or, or HIFU. Uh, HIFU was cleared by uh, Medicare the, uh, at the beginning of 2021, and that's opened the door to us using it more widely in patients. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, um, a, an algorithm when we diagnose men with prostate cancer. I, I've always advocated what I call a stepwise decision process with my patients. For Step one is do they need treatment or not? And if they're low risk by treatment parameters, then we spend a lot of time convincing them they don't need treatment. If they do need treatment, then the next step is, are they candidates for focal therapy? And you know the, the, the proper indications or inclusion criteria for focal is quite widely debated, but at least for me, it's intermediate risk patients with small volume disease localized to a region of the prostate by MRI and biopsy. And if they're open to that, then that's an option. If they're not, then we move on to more traditional decision-making with surgery versus radiation. Right, no, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, and Claire, you've been a pioneer in this area as well, I understand, 
uh, in terms of focal therapy. So, I mean, at the moment, what we're, we're running a, a registry doing focal therapy on exactly the sort of patients you're talking about, Samir, um, but we're using actually brachytherapy as the energy source, but just delivering it to the tumour itself um, with a five millimetre safety margin, knowing that the tumours on MRI are always a little bit bigger in real life. Claire, are you, are you practising focal in your institution? Um, we are doing a little bit of a mixture. Uh, we don't have the same high volume as Samir, but we've been involved in clinical trials with InsightTech on the um, exablate transrectal HIFU or transrectal MR guided focused ultrasound surgery um, and have been working in that space for quite a while. Uh, we also do cryo and that, you know, we that's it. I think we've, yeah, we haven't, we've, We've try, we're trying to determine which one of these might be best and set in the clinic, but um, both mainly most most of our work has been in focal uh, focused ultrasound surgery. I did do dose escalated brachytherapy back several years ago with Anthony D'Amico, yep. um, not focal brachy as I think you're describing. Uh, ours was still a whole gland, but it was dose escalated to the target based on MRI. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that program discontinued, but. Um, Interesting to, I'm glad you're doing the brachytherapy. I think that's a, a really nice, nice application. Yeah, well, the, the rationale was that, you know, we've, at least in Melbourne, we've got a lot of experience with brachytherapy um, over the last couple of decades. Uh, you know, most of the guys here have been trained in Seattle uh, with their technique and with whole gland sort of being, uh, I guess, less often used, um, it was really a good opportunity to use that expertise um, locally, but just just targeting, but but with very strict eligibility criteria, as Samir was uh, alluding to. Valder, are you uh, using any uh, performing any focal in in Brazil? Actually, at our town institution, mostly brac therapy and focal not yet. Actually, in Brazil, I think two or three centers are doing high mm -hmm. The others are are not. It's not a very well disseminated technique here. But um, we do a lot of patients on BRAC therapy for, for sure. Uh, and just a comment in, the, in this case, Jeremy. He, when we report, he, he, you usually don't mention this information, but I think for this case and for all the ethical lesions, you, you usually uh, put on the report the length of member nose urethra. I think that this helps this right. really helps the, the urologists for APCO lesions. So usually when a lesion like that, a big lesion like that, you usually mention the length of the retro member, the member nose of retro. Okay. That's that's a great point. Thank you for, for raising that. Um Richard, is that something that, that you do sometimes or or that you've thought about doing? Measuring oh, I missed what that was. What the, do you mean? measuring the length of the membranous urethra? Um, that's not something I've been routinely doing, but maybe I should. Yeah, I think it would be really worthwhile, actually, because um, it can certainly relate to the uh, the chance of continence post yeah. if yeah. the patient undergoes radical prostatectomy. It gives you an idea of what the risk of incontinence. Yeah, it's not the, it's not our routine, but for ape collisions, it's it's interesting to mention that. Okay. Thank you, Valdir. That's that's terrific. All right. We, now, rightly or wrongly, this patient did not undergo staging. Um, they had a Gleason 3 plus 4 or Gray Group 2, and so went straight to a radical prostatectomy. Um, Andrew, would you like to show us what we what we found? This is a, a reconstructed um, picture that we do for all our radical prostates. You may see these little lines here. Uh, so these are the quadrant uh, slices of the prostate um, and the parasagal apical and uh, base slices. And they're reconstructed using um, a flatbed scanner really, and then uh, orientated so that the picture comes up. We've marked the tumor on the actual slides. Um, so orange designates the index tumor and black is the other tumor foci. Yellow indicates extra prostatic extension and red, the, the po any positive margin. Um, in this case, is not here, but we then also designate seminal vesicle involvement as well. So the picture itself demonstrates nicely the MRI lesion that we saw down towards the apex, lower mid and apex uh, anteriorly. But um, as Jeremy just mentioned before, it's often larger than what we see on the MRI. There was also additional foci on the right and left posterior lateral uh, angles. Uh, at the apex and up towards the, the mid of the gland. Um, and on the, I'll just 
done a histology picture there to show morphologically most of it was asinotype, but there was also some ductal type adenocarcinoma within this lesion as well. So 5% reported as 5% ductal adenocarcinoma. So just the summary is the uh, index lesion is down towards that uh, left uh, anterior apex um, to mid uh, 4 plus 3, 60% with some ductal morphology, extra prostatic extension at that, at that area and a positive margin up to three millimeters. So 3A. Mm. Thanks, Andrew. And I have to say, you know, these volumetric studies and the way they're presented um, in terms of learning how to read prostate MRI are just brilliant for providing feedback to the radiologists um, to then, you know, compare against. Um, uh, we've just found them invaluable uh, over the years. And, 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 and this act, these sort of diagrams actually are what really underpin uh, the, the MRI Pro training program uh, that we've got. So I, I don't know if there are any comments uh, on that pathology. It, it, it's obviously a little bit better, actually. Yes, there was a positive margin, but it was small and apical. And in fact, this patient is now two years down the track and his PSAs remain undetectable. Um, but, but I guess it, it actually, you know, to your point, Claire, it looked pretty bad. And, 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 and even on the biopsy, you know, could it be invading skeletal muscle in the sphincter? But actually, uh, we managed to get away with uh, it not being quite so bad. Yeah, I think uh, anterior margins in particular, the apex, are very tough to understand the significance because, uh, you know, I've learned that even when we excise a wide hood of dorsal vein and connective tissue all the way over the membranous urethra, mm -hmm. upon extraction, it all just retracts back. So... I think a lot of that is a, uh, artifactual. The, the dorsal vein will actually retract all the way back to the bladder neck after you've divided it. Uh, and so whether you actually are leaving disease behind, I, I, I strongly favor observation in patients like this uh, and waiting to see what their PSA does over time. Yeah. Yeah, all right. So let's move on to the next case. Um, case two, Richard, if you're happy to, to get the images up, um, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, while that's happening, while that's happening, um, I would love to find out, I guess, from, from, from Claire first, perhaps, where is MRI at, prostate MRI at, uh, in your perspective, in the US at the moment? Obviously, there's been a lot of change in this space over the last few years. Um, is it routine? Uh, yes. In, now, when you say that, is that in your institution, though, or is that across the board? Um, I think we are seeing huge growth in volume uh, doing across the board, probably more so in the larger cities where there's more access to MRI. Yeah. Um, I'm a PI of a trial for uh, ECOG Akron, which is a large National Conference of Cancer Center trial. Um, where we're seeing, you know, large numbers of sites that are spread right across the United States and Hawaii, um, all actively enrolling. Um, you, you know, we're not speaking right now about specific indications for prostate MRI, but in general, the volumes are, are dramatically up. Uh, they're straining the system. Uh, the system is um, challenged because of the volume. Uh, the system meaning access, the system meaning numbers of radiologists required. Uh, the volumes are definitely putting pressure on us. Our training programs are trying to keep up. Our educational offerings are trying to keep up. Our quality reviews and activities based in the American College of Radiology are really ramping up uh, to meet the demand because, of course, uh, there's huge quality issues and, and dissemination and learning and variabilities from site to site, just like there are in any other aspects of medicine. People need to do a certain volume to get to a certain level of expertise. So, you know, it's a long answer, but the, the short answer is yes. <laughs> I think we lost Jeremy, did we? Well, just while he's coming back, we have, um, it's been on our, what we call our Medicare schedule, which means it's reimbursed by government for about the last uh, 18 months or so. So we've been doing it for, I suppose, off and on uh, 10 years, uh, but it's become much more popular since it's been reimbursed without question. For sure. And yeah. sometimes the quality does not improve. 
in that situation. You know, we've, observed, we've observed the same. Uh, I, I agree with Claire that I think the groundswell behind MRI is really notable within the last 24 months. And some of that is the fact that more and more third party payers are starting to adopt uh, indications for pre biopsy MRI uh, in 2020 and 2021. Uh, it used to be that if I got 10 prostate cancer referrals in a week, that maybe two or three of them would have already had an MRI. I think now that's over 50% anecdotally, but it, it exactly as Claire says, that the more rural area the patient's coming from, the less likely they've already had an MRI before their biopsy. I think the interesting question in the United States, though, is how are people using the MRI? Uh, I always talk about the two applications of MRI, one being guidance of the biopsy, uh, and two being uh, risk stratification and decision of whether patient needs a biopsy. The first, you know, the guidance of the biopsy, I think that's being widely adopted in the United States. Most people agree that doing an MRI guided or targeted biopsy is better than systematic, although I still see patients who get an MRI and then get no targeting, uh, but mostly that's accepted. The more controversy is still whether patient, whether physicians in the United States would feel comfortable avoiding a biopsy based on a normal MRI that's been popularized in Europe we do it, but I don't think most American urologists still feel comfortable saying a normal MRI or a low suspicion MRI means a biopsy can be avoided. Mm, that's fascinating, Samir. So, so in other words, MRI has been added to the uh, algorithm of, of, of the workup algorithm, but is not triaging for biopsy at this stage. Yeah, and I think this is a point of continual debate. The you know the AUA and other uh, large advocacy groups in the U.S. have not yet bought into that idea that it should be uniformly used for that. Uh, there's a fear of missed cancers and the liability that goes with it. But I've always made the argument that the only way to justify the cost of MRI and the diagnostic pathway is if you're using it to reduce the number of biopsies you're doing. Uh, and if you're not doing that, then it's just cost escalation. Mm, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, very interesting. And certainly in Australia, uh, we are using it uh, as a triage. Uh, but but you have to have confidence uh, that the radiology reporting, when it is negative, it is actually truly negative. Now, there are obviously other factors at play, PSA density, uh, other clinical factors. But so, um, I've observed over the last few years here in Australia, um, exactly what you're describing, Samir, where initially you're not used to getting the, the images. And so you go ahead with a biopsy, even if it's negative. And then, you know, after a period of time, when you keep coming back with negative biopsies on, on PIRADS one and twos, you, you stop doing the biopsies, um, but it takes time. And, uh, and you, I think you, you do have to get that experience. If you, if you do that prematurely, then you're at risk of, of missing cancers because the, the radiologist might just might not be experienced enough. It just, I think it's just, really adds you know further support to the notion that that uh, training and education in this space is absolutely paramount um you know, one thing i just add to that as well as I, I agree in, with everything that's been said um it's really important to follow the man who has a negative mri that you do not biopsy um you know those are not meant to just go back out to the community and say hey great everything's negative i'm done uh, you know, Yelly Baronson, I think, in Anwar and others, we've written this in our uh, articles on the pathway. And uh, the pathway really means that you should still follow these guys because a negative MRI is not always negative. We know that there's a false, there's a false negative rate of 10, maybe 12% varies from person to person. So must have a safety net in place. Right. Yep, absolutely agree with that. And, and that's what we do. You know, if it's negative, we don't just uh, flick them back to the general practitioners. We would then see them again yeah, they've, they've come with you to you uh, usually with a, an elevated PSA and so we will repeat it a PSA down the track and then do it again and so forth um, just moving on we have had uh, some comments uh, in the chat here one's from Stefan Heinz who's a radiologist here in Melbourne asking about the status of in bore guided MRI biopsy in the US uh, Claire are you doing that we are doing that. We started doing that many, many years ago, about 20 years ago or so, for some, um, because we were doing brachytherapy at the time. Um, so we do a transperineal in-bore biopsy, but we also have a, a, a fusion biopsy program as well, of course, transrectal, 
Uh, so, because you can't obviously accommodate the volume with an inbore biopsy program, it's very difficult to compete for magnet time. So um, I think that the, there is a small minority of places that do inbore biopsies in the US. Um, I think this may be more uh, widespread in Europe but um, not that many places are doing it. But we reserve it, of course, for the anterior lesions, uh, the larger prostates, the hard to reach locations, uh, the guys perhaps, you know, obviously the surgical resection of the rectum, no access, um, all of those kinds. And then patients who have high risk of sepsis or who may have had sepsis before um, and for some reason have significant comorbidities. But we still do it. Uh, we do something like four or five cases a week. Uh, it's still fairly busy. Mm, that's just a, a quickly a practical point before we get on to this second case. Um, how do you find doing transperineal biopsy in bore? Um, is that is that challenging from a, a logistical point of view? Well, it's there's no official commercial sort of package that you can buy and helps you just sort of set it up. So you know that we do it using the stirrups and a brachytherapy template um, and. You know, it's fairly simple and do it under intravenous conscious sedation. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, body habitus is a concern in certain patients, of course, um, but and it's a relatively long procedure. It's not as quick as an office based biopsy by any stretch. So clearly not made for mainstream uh, high volume, but it is uh, it is definitely feasible and works relatively well. We do a lot of registration and it's all MR to MR. So there's no ultrasound involved. So your image registration is improved. And, you know, I mean, full disclosure, I have an NIH grants that support this activity. Um, so I have computer scientists and I have some engineers who are very interested in designing robotic devices and enabling technologies to help extend the, the arm. Uh, when I, my, my arm's relatively short, so I don't get too far, but um, one of my colleagues has got longer arms, but we're going to, you know, there's a lot of work going on in robotics to try to ensure that you can get access to as much of the prostate as possible. And you really can at the face of the clock, you know, it's not a problem to sample the 12 o'clock lesions, but not, not, a, not a high volume mainstream thing. Gotcha. Okay. All right. In the interest of time, let's uh, move on to this second case. Um, so this is quite a young guy, 48 year old man um, with a strong family history, father, brother, um, having prostate cancer. His PSA was 5.4. Uh, he had no urinary symptoms. Uh, his uh, urine dipstick was negative. So he had this MRI, Richard. Okay, this is uh, an interesting case, a small volume prostate just on 20 cc. You can see the uh, in the uh, sagittals in the top right hand corner. I'll just again link them with the uh, post contrasts. So again, if we go from base to apex, uh, we can see a good example of the uh, central zone here. Uh, transition zone here, peripheral zone here. And as we go from base to apex, there's no definite focal lesion. Uh, I'm a believer in what I call the, the dirty, uh, the dirty trans the dirty peripheral zone. That is to say the peripheral zone, it looks the same as the transition zone. It's homogeneously decreased signal intensity on T2 images. Now you do see that in younger men. Uh, and really, I find in this situation, you have to really interrogate the diffusion very closely and to look at the DCE very closely to see if there is a focal lesion, which there is not in this situation. So I, look, I actually measure the ADC and I have a cutoff, which is specific to our equipment, really. And in my cutoff um, above 1100 ADC, I'm happy to say that's going to be benign. Below 900, I'm very happy to say that's going to be uh, a par as four or five. And so this uh, transition area, uh, which I use is about 1000. So this patient has got an ADC of 1000 throughout the gland. So I call this, it's probably not quite pyrates. I call this a pyrates three. And I say to the surgeons, I can't give you a, I can't give you a place to biopsy, but this patient should be biopsy. Okay, thank you, Richard. Now, so PIRADS 3 is, is obviously a pretty interesting area. Um, as urologists, we kind of see it as a bit of a fence-sitting call, but sometimes, as, as perhaps in this case, there are genuine PIRADS 3 cases. Um, Valder, one of the things that we've noticed that is uh, that amongst inexperienced radiologists, there's a much higher rate of calling PIRADS 3, and it can, can be used almost as a marker of 
confidence or experience. Um, what do you think about this case? Would you, what would you call it? Yeah, this, this is a very uh, interesting case to approach. And as Richard said, that you, you can easily find prostate like this, uh, especially in the, the peripheral zone looking uh, diffusely and slightly hyperintensive. That could be very easy to find in young guys who have prostatitis. So, but you have to be aware because uh, not call prostatite every time. So the, you, you have to, to be aware that the, the two conditions may coexist in the prostate. So you have to look carefully for all this uh, in these situations, I think. Like in any prostate MRI, diffusion rate imaging is, 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 is the most important sequence. But it, you have to look very carefully to the WI on this case. And also, like Claire said at the beginning of the session about the, the value of DCE. And I really like DCE in this case also to, to have a complete view on this case. And another point is to, to, to see the whole patient. So to see the patients like uh, all the information. So look at the background of this patient. So they have the previous history of uh, prostatitis. How is his PSA? Is his PSA increasing or, or stable? And especially the, the PSA density, I think, could be uh, very useful in case like this. Because so I agree with Richard, you can call easily a pirate three with a clear justification, not uh, like you mentioned. There's a there's an increased rate of pirate three and in less experienced readers, but this I think this is a good case to call pirate three. And the, the decision go to biopsy or not going to biopsy is based on, on in the whole picture. And like I said, some of this. Factors may be in the imaging and some other it be like uh, information of the patients as familiar, uh, personal <clears throat> information. And also, like I said, the, the PSA derivative parameters can be very uh, useful for deciding or not to do a biopsy like in this case. Mm, yeah, so so he, he did have a sustained uh, PSA elevation. He's got that strong family history. And, and I mean, when you see a young guy like this, your first thought is prostatitis, but uh, no urinary symptoms, and as I mentioned, uh, certainly no suspicion of that on a midstream urine. Now, that doesn't rule it out. Um, Samir, yeah. do you have any thoughts on this case as you see it so far? Yeah, so I, I would feel he needs a biopsy, but I, I do think the experience with Pyrads 3 is a very interesting problem as we go forward. I, ideally, when you create a five-point radiologic scale or a Likert scale or a Pyrad scale, the point of the three should be the indeterminate lesion, right? Just as we would utilize for category two F cyst or something of that sort. But I, I don't get the sense that's the way it's used in the United States. Perhaps that's the way it's used more in Europe. And in talking to colleagues in Europe, PIRED three is an individualized decision process where I think in the US more often we tend to biopsy PIRED three, four, five routinely. Our own institutional data shows for PIRED three we identify cancer in the target more than 50% of the time and clinically significant cancer about 35% of the time. Uh, and I think that reflects the way our MRIs are read. But I do think there needs to be more experience with PIRADS nationally. A lot of people in the community will not read something, they, they will not read anything as PIRAD1. If it's a normal study, they call it PIRAD2. And if there's any lesion, it goes up to three, four, five, when in fact, really two should be a lesion unlikely to be cancer. And if you can spread out that risk, then three becomes more significant. And I think that's what happens in my institution. So I think yeah. he needs a biopsy. Claire, any, any additional comments to that? No, I, you know, I think it's, it's a really interesting dilemma. And this is why we came out with PIRADS version 2.1 was to try to help people with the PIRADS three classification. Um, and I agree, I think the Pirates 1 and 2 are not being used as much as they should. Um, and many of us in the past were stuck, it's Pirates 4 or 5 and I don't care about anything else, um, really. But that's not, you're absolutely right. We have to spread out and, and uh, vote the range, as they say at the NIH, when you've got a scale of 0 to 10, you, you know, you should use to, and, and think about each number each time. Um, this case, I, I don't see anything really focal, and I, and I think I would have probably thought this was pirate prostatitis, 
Um, I think the family history, and I don't know what the PSA density was. I suspect with a PSA of five and a tiny gland like this, it's going to be a, a, a uh, you know, 0 0.15 or certainly 0 0.2. Um, so that would probably tilt the scale. And I think we really do need to use PSA density. We calculated and reported in all our reports, because I do think in some of these indeterminate situations, it can be a helpful decision maker. And the most accurate density measurement will come from the MRI volume and the most recent PSA. So um, I think this is a case where the MRI is not terribly helpful, but it's certainly not showing you a target to go after. It's, it's a, this is a person who needs a standard systematic sampling. Right, so that's what he underwent. Andrew, have you got that there? I do, yes. Uh, so he's got disease predominantly on the left-hand side, left anterior, left mid, left posterior, a little bit on the right anterior. Um, the highest grade tumour is four plus three, uh, four millimetres in that left posterior zone. Okay. So on the strength of that, uh, he then went on to have uh, surgery. So... Uh, there we go. So uh, this is, again, the volumetric picture. His index lesion is in the left apex to mid um, posteriorly. Uh, he's also got smaller tumor foci, left anterior and, and right mid. Um, the focus, although it's four plus three on biopsy, um, there's a note here about the pattern four being concentrated uh, in a small area and the overall Gleason score for the lesion is three plus four, 10%. So significant downgrade, um, but based on this concentrated area, um, uh, no evidence of extra prostatic extension and margins negative. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Richard, are you able to go back, to, based on, on that reading, are you able to go back to the images just to see if we can you know, in retrospect, and this is the beauty of having these volumetrics is, you know, is there anything there that now you know where it is uh, in, in the real, um, can you see anything? I'm just putting those four together again. Uh, so again, going from base to apex, it, I mean, it's slightly darker on the left than the right. Mm. And maybe there's a little bit of contrast enhancement here, but there's not really enough to call. And the ADC is, it maybe it's a little bit darker on the left than it is on the right, but it's not dark enough mm. to get to a Pyrates 4 lesion, I think. Claire, do you agree? Yeah, I'm just looking at that three o'clock location there, Richard, at the apex. And the, you know, obviously now with the with hindsight, would we have thought about that a bit? There's the, you know, your blush of enhancement there at two, three o'clock. Um, possibly relates to this lesion. And then on the T2, there, uh, the apical image on the top left, if you want to go down a little further, I think there was something a little bit interesting uh, down to the apex on that top left. Yeah, one up again, maybe. Yeah, you see there and again about that same location. It, it's, it's a soft call and that's probably why it was a pirate. You know, you might have, you might have had to, you know, suggest direct a needle to that area, but this is not an easy case. If, if, Claire, if you were really strictly following Pyrads version 2.1, um, would you would you call this a Pyrads 2? Just had that question in from the from the chat there. So, so Pyrads 2 uh, in the peripheral zone, I have it right beside me, so I'm going to quote you directly what it's supposed to be. So it wouldn't be a 2. It's supposed to be linear slash wedge-shaped hypo on the ADC, linear slash wedge-shaped hyper on the high B. So it's really not linear or wedge shaped. So there's a little bit of a line, I suppose, at the top of it. But if we go back up to the T2 definitions, uh, I don't think it makes a pyrads two either. So I think three was the right way to call it. But you weren't, you know, you were calling three sort of generally, I think. Yes. Yeah. yeah right. That's right. So three for that would be heterogeneous uh, with obscured margins, and also includes, and this is where it is sort of the the uh, intermediate everything. It includes others that do not qualify as two, four, or five. So you know that's it's it, that's what three is. It's yep. the most problematic yep. group, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just a quick comment on staging. I, I, I skipped over because I wanted to really focus on the MRI. But um, this patient, because he had grade grade three or four plus three on biopsy, he had a PSMA PET scan. We haven't got the images to show right now, but. Um, we're using PSMA PET scan routinely for high grade uh, prostate cancers for staging. But what's interesting is that it's also starting to uh, 
be used as sometimes a little bit of a tiebreaker um, in terms of whether it, whether or not we even choose to do a biopsy. If the MRI is equivocal, just being another non-invasive test, and we're, we're very fortunate that we can get it done very cheaply here, at least in Australia. Um, Samir, are you using uh, PSMA PET for staging or even sometimes to assess the primary situation, perhaps say when MRI is contraindicated, bilateral total hip replacements, et cetera? So the answer to that, Jeremy, has really changed within the last two months, wow. um, three months, because uh, we don't, we still don't have uh, gallium, uh, gallium 68 PSMA available to us in the United States or reimbursed. Uh, it's only approved for use investigationally on the West Coast at two institutions. But as of, I think, May, um, uh, DCFPYL, PSMA targeted PET, was approved in the United States. And uh, our institution and others have taken a little while to get it up and running and reimbursed. But as of literally last week, now I can get uh, Medicare to pay for PET MRI using uh, the, the DCF PYL. So we're still exploring how that'll change our, our treatment uh, and diagnostic algorithms in the United States. Because of course, the concern with PSMA PET in staging primarily is that it will have something of a Will Rogers effect in that it'll shift uh, the, the metastatic population to an earlier stage metastatic and make treatment look better for them and it will remove the truly high risk from the high risk and make local therapy look better for them. Uh, but whether we really should be withholding therapy in the primary staging setting using that uh, is a question we don't have. So we're approved for use in primary staging of high risk disease and in for recurrence, but not in elevated PSA. We just don't have the ability to do that unless patients are gonna pay for it out of pocket. Yeah, and, and I should point out that that's, that's a similar uh, situation here. Actually, we don't have reimbursement yet for PSMA PET, although it's on its way. I think we'll probably uh, obtain that next year. But uh, the vast majority of use here is, is staging, not, certainly not for uh, elevated PSA. But we're just noticing, because we've had a few years now of regular use of PSMA PET for staging, that it's one of those things where the there's a bit of creep in terms of its indications and it's starting to... Uh, uh, because we're seeing just how incredibly useful it is. And I, I think that point you made, Samir, is absolutely critical about, there's no question, once you've had a few years of experience of it, it's like it's chalk and cheese versus bone scan and CT as the, as the traditional staging, but we don't know what to do with, with that greater accuracy um, and the, the Will Rogers phenomenon uh, and so forth. Claire, have you got any experience with, with that before we finish the session? Not much to add. We're in the very similar place to, to Samaria, even though New York and Massachusetts are two different states, we're in the same coast and uh, have the same issues with reimbursement. So it's certainly um, very slow and it's just, uh, we're finally uh, catching up with the rest of the world a little bit on the PSMA whole story, to be honest. And, and Valdez, just uh, uh, I know I'm mindful that uh, the hour is almost up. It, it, have you got any experience with PSMA PET for staging? Yeah, for staging, the, the most of uh, health uh, healthcare reimbursement are are okay in Brazil for staging, but like I mentioned, for primary lesion, you hardly use the PET PSMA, and the gallium sixty eight is is I would say reasonably available in Brazil, especially in the south of the country. So you have a, a great experience of the PS uh, PET PS, PSMA for staging. But, but the healthcare don't, does cover the cost for primary lesions right yeah. now. Yeah, which is, the, which is the same here. All right, we are at nine o'clock. So um, Samir, I know has to go, but I'll be saying goodbye to, to everybody because I want you to all be able to get on with your day. Samir, Claire, Valder, Andrew, Richard, thank you all so much for joining us. It's been another fantastic session. I hope it's been useful for everyone who's in the audience. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget also that there is that current free offer for one month uh, of MRI Pro. And, and the whole point of all this, of course, is to improve everyone's ability to read these scans accurately. So thanks again, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah.